the great honor of introducing Dr. Ren Massey, who is a licensed psychologist who's practiced in the Atlanta area for over 28 years. And after two years of consulting in a residential psychiatric hospital, an outdoor treatment program with children and adolescents, he went into full-time independent practice. He provides psychotherapy and assessment uh, for children, adolescents, and adults, and he's done bariatric surgery, forensic, and gender identity evaluations, as well as been an expert witness in state and federal courts. So Dr. Massey has published on several topic areas, including gender identity, and he presents seminars primarily on gender identity issues. He's provided training uh, for mental and medical health care professionals and students for the U.S. Federal Bureau of Prison Staff um, and faculties and staffs of numerous schools as well as universities. He's on the faculty of the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, called WPATH, yes, Global Education Initiative, and he was selected for the committee developing the Global Education Initiative curriculum. Dr. Massey is a director at large on WPATH Board of Directors, and he also serves on the committee to update the adolescents and institutions chapter of the WPATH standards of care for people who are transgender and gender non-conforming. He is an adjunct faculty member of the Emory University School of Medicine. So let's welcome Dr. Ren Massey. Good morning. Thank you, Elizabeth. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here and kick off your three-week series on gender diversity issues here at St. Luke's. And I thank Elizabeth and Halla and Michelle Jimmett for their helping coordinate all this at Takes a Village. And I hopefully we'll bring some good information here. I really applaud St. Luke's for reaching out to minister to this population which is increasingly visible in our country and our culture. But as we'll see, needs a sense of safety and support to be able to contribute fully to our society. So today we're going to cover some foundational information as well as some terms and etiquette and some issues in faith, school, work, family, and also a little bit about what St. Luke's can do. It's ambitious for a half an hour. So. All right, since uh, the earlier services ran a little late, I'm going to skip this exercise, unfortunately. But I want to start by talking about historical assumptions. You know, most of us are raised with these ideas about gender and uh, gender identity to the a point that we don't even realize that these assumptions have been made. So it is assumed that at birth, we're going to be able to tell who is male and who's female based on external genitalia. Or sometimes in neuro, we're assuming that nowadays. And at, at that time, it's assumed that a person with a certain genitalia has XY chromosomes, if they have male genitalia, and that they're going to then be assigned a male gender marker at birth and assumed to take on a male gender role. And a part of that is going to be expected to do gender performance kinds of behaviors that are typically male and to present in typical male attire. And then furthermore, they're going to uh, be attracted to females. That's considered to be kind of part of the natural assumption of things with people assigned a male gender marker. Similarly, people who are assigned a female gender marker at birth based on their genitalia are going to be assumed to take on a female gender identity and assumed to be showing female gender role and gender expression and then naturally attracted to males. So as I started studying this area, it was really useful for me to start realizing these kinds of binary expectations don't really fit a number of people in our culture. So I think of this as kind of biology outside the binary. And when I think about that, I'm thinking about Intersex conditions are a really important 
thing to think about that are examples of biology not being so black and white. Intersex conditions used to be called uh, hermaphrodite, you know, hermaphroditism, and what we see is that there are a number of hormonal and chromosomal conditions, and I'm not going to go into them a lot, but there are a number of conditions that lead to individuals having ambiguous genitalia or having reproductive organs of both sexes or a number of different kinds of variations. Now, this can, can come about because of chromosomal differences, like they have XXXY chromosomes, or it may be that they have hormonal conditions that lead to the feminization of somebody with typical male chromosomes or feminization of somebody with typical female chromosomes. So it was really helpful to me to get that, oh, biology is not so binary as we're taught to begin with and raised in our culture. And so maybe transgender and gender diversity issues, it also made sense maybe they are not as binary also, that people's inner experiences would not be so binary. So I like this picture of Ellen because it shows, here's a great example who, of somebody who does identify as female, but isn't doing a typical female gender role presentation. And she also isn't fitting in those binary expectations because she is attracted to women instead of attracted to men. These are a number of women who are transgender and very successful in a number of areas, from the woman in the middle who is, was a colonel in the Chinese army and the first woman to transition in China, to the woman on the bottom left, competed in the Miss Canada contest, to the woman in the top right who is one of the Wachowski sisters, Lana Wachowski, used to be of the Wachowski brothers, who both transitioned, and they brought us the Matrix trilogy and some other entertainment. So when we look at these things a little more closely with some clarification like I just provided, what we see is that actually we need to think of these things independently. That our chromosomes and our biology is a separate from our legal label that is done to each of us, that is assigned to us at birth. And that can be totally different than our gender identity, our inner experience of ourselves. And our social presentation is also independent of these things. And then finally, sexual orientation is not related to any of the above. Now, for some folks, there are a lot of folks who all of those things fit the, that kind of ladder of assumptions. But for a lot of people, those assumptions don't fit. And in fact, in Western countries, there have been a number of studies and what we're seeing is that about 1% of people are identifying as transgender. That's kind of culling down a range of things we're seeing in more recent studies. So that means in Metro Atlanta, where there are 60, uh, 6 million people approximately, there are about 60,000 transgender individuals. 60,000 in just Metro Atlanta. And then if we look at people who are identifying as gender non-conforming, gender non-binary, that's around 2% in recent studies. So that's double the number. So that's about 3% of the population who those assumptions don't really fit for. And it's much higher than was estimated in previous work and in the current diagnostic and statistical manual used in my profession. And I get quite a few calls in my office each week for folks seeking my services. Now, to work in this population, you have to kind of be open-minded. There's an evolving vocabulary. And what I'm going to go over is a few introductory concepts here. We've got transgender as an umbrella term to refer to anybody whose gender identity doesn't match what they experience themselves, what the gender marker was they were assigned to them at birth. So their inner experience doesn't match the gender marker assigned at birth. Now, the most well-known are people who are male to female, or also you may go by the term transgender woman, trans woman, or just may prefer woman. There are also people who go by the term trans man, male, uh, female to male, or transgender man, or just may prefer the term man. Transsexual is an old school term a lot of people don't care for. Some people do prefer it. I don't typically use it 
when I do talks, uh, because when we say sex or sexual in our country, people kind of uh, clench a little bit. And so I prefer the word gender because it's often much more about gender. And cisgender means what most people experience, that their gender marker does match their gender identity. And the exercise I was going to ask you to do would have you write with your opposite hand. So I want you to think about, when you think about your handedness, if you're a lefty, think about trying to do everything with your right hand. Or if you're right-handed, imagine trying to do everything with your left hand. That's a really small, small taste of what it's like trying to live in a gender that doesn't fit you. Trying to go opposite to your way of being, and yet you also couldn't tell somebody how you know which hand is better for you, it just it feels right. That's kind of what gender identity experiences are like. So an umbrella term for folks who are gender expansive or gender creative or a number of other ways of talking about it, we've got a few terms like gender non-conforming or gender non-binary and gender variant is an old school term not used so much nowadays. And this is for folks who either may not need to go through a gender transition from all the, all the way from male to female or female to male, or maybe they are questioning and kind of in the process of exploring it. Uh, but there are a number of people who are not able to or don't need to, don't feel that they need to. They just don't want to be stuck in a binary label. So here are some creative ways people can be gender nonconforming, gender nonbinary. There's people who are gender queer, which means they kind of are rejecting some of the social norms and the application of the binary labels. So I knew a fella who was very masculine looking, he was in fact bald, had a beard, and he'd gone through a gender transition, changed his uh, gender marker legally, but he did not change his name. So if his name was Jane, I'd be talking to Jane, and I, you know, I'm saying his name and I'm thinking Jane, and I, even I working in this field, I could not get comfortable, like I couldn't just rest in the binary. And so there was this kind of ongoing reminder that, oh, this person is evidence that the gender binary does not work for everybody. So there are also individuals who identify as gender fluid. So they may experience different energy or different masculinity or femininity throughout a day or throughout a week or throughout a month. I had somebody who I saw who said that their child said, sometimes you're a boy and sometimes you're a girl to this parent. And it wasn't because they changed their attire, but just because this kid was picking up different energy. Some folks identify kind of more on a spectrum of being masculine or feminine without needing to transition. Cross-dressing, kind of a holdover term in my opinion, because we apply it to males who wear female attire, whereas there's much more latitude. Ellen is not labeled a cross-dresser when she wears more masculine attire. And drag performers, you all may know, do entertainment for a short period of time. It's kind of hyper-masculine or hyper-feminine versions of performing gender. And there are also folks who live part-time in a gender because they maybe can't transition at work or because they are waiting until their children grow up, they want to let them finish high school or something, or uh, because of finances or they live in a rural area. So a number of reasons people may live part-time in genders that fit them and part-time in genders that don't. I like this picture, these pictures of Eddie Izzard because they show, if you don't know him, he's a very talented actor and comedian. He performed at the Fox a number of years ago. He makes world history really funny. He's really good. And uh, that's a stretch for me. He, uh, when I see these pictures of him, and he performs in the, in the typically female attire, although he would tell you they're not women's clothes because they're his. So he says, you know, I see so much more creativity an energy that somebody can bring when they're able to bring themselves fully to whatever endeavor they're doing. So let me tell you briefly about how I got into this area of work. I did not expect to be working in this area because back in 1989, not a lot of people were doing... I did, Siri. Go away. <laughs> 
just trying to check my time. So we were, <laughs> there was not a lot going on in gender issues back in 1989 when I got my PhD. But what I had always been interested in gender issues because I was born in 1962 and being raised in the 60s and 70s was the women's lib era was going on. And I didn't like all the rules for women and girls. So I was curious about what was going on. I didn't like those rules because I was assigned a female gender marker at birth. I was raised a female, and those rules didn't feel like they fit for me, those expectations. And I remember telling a friend when I was eight years old that I wanted to be a boy, but back in 1970, it didn't seem like there were a lot of options, so I'm just like, well, I guess I'll make the best of life and, you know, what, what I'm dealing with. And then in high school, well, also I was fortunate because even though my parents were very conservative, my dad's of Hispanic origin and my mother's a good old-fashioned Southern woman, and my dad's first career was as a Navy officer, so kind of traditional folk. But they let me, they thought it was kind of charming that I was a tomboy and that I was uh, playing with marbles and Hot Wheels and riding bikes and playing football with the boys. But then in high school, I also realized, oh, and I'm attracted to girls. And I thought that explained the rest of why I didn't feel quite comfortable and felt like I'm really awkward. Plus, I just thought all teenagers feel awkward. So I guess this is just me being a teenager. Well, long story short, you know, I mean, in high school, I tried to girl up. Think about that. Not terribly comfortable for this person you see before you. And then in college, I had my first girlfriend. I was at a very conservative college. Preacher's daughter, that was, that's another story we don't have enough time for. But in I mean, after college and grad school, I actually came out as a lesbian and lived in the lesbian and gay community for about 20 years. And I was fortunate to have built a successful practice. And over that time, I became more and more butch, as they say in the lesbian community. And, uh, you know, my hair got shorter, and I would wear suits, and, you know, I was uh, about as masculine as I could be, but something still wasn't right for me. And so I needed to explore this, and I started coming into more awareness of transgender issues because of the media and some things in my office. And I think that because my practice was stable, I had a good relationship of 10 years, I had a stepdaughter who was nearly done with her college years, things with my parents and family had kind of smoothed out because if you recall, I mentioned they were rather conservative and traditional. They were not thrilled when I came out as a lesbian. And so, you know, it was just a quiet time in my life. And when I started getting this awareness, I will tell you that I was terrified. I went through a year of disbelief, like, no, 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 no. This can't be a real thing. And then I went through about a year of shame. And as, as this process started, I was really grateful that I had a strong faith community that I was a part of because I was able to talk with the folks in my faith community and get their love and support. And also, I was grateful I had a strong spiritual practice because I really prayed a lot. I wore out the holes and knees in my pants and I, I was praying a lot, I was meditating often, and here's where I feel my, my gender journey is inextricably interwoven with my spiritual journey. Because I was given guidance every day about the next step to take. I was clear about call this person, research this, take this step, notify these people, talk to this doctor. It was just a blessing for me all along the way. And I'll tell you, when you do a gender transition, it's even harder, at least for me it was, 
than coming out as a lesbian. Because yeah, I had to tell everybody. If I wanted to keep my life intact in place, I had to tell my car mechanic, who I trusted, my accountant, my office landlord, a couple of my neighbors so they wouldn't wonder who's walking the dogs now. You know, I had to tell everybody, in addition to all of my clients, all of my colleagues, and my friends and family. It's exhausting. People need a lot of TLC during that time. I was very fortunate, and this is part of why I tell my story, because not everybody is so fortunate, that I was met with a lot of love and support, and quite a, <laughs> quite a few people said, well, I'd wondered if you'd ever thought about that. So, <laughs> so it, it was not a big leap for me, people to get that I was needing to complete this kind of expression of my masculinity as I transitioned. You know, so I went through this year of shame and then a year of fear in which I did all this coming out to so many people. And I was just so fortunate that I was supported by my friends, family, clients, and colleagues. I will tell you two things briefly about my story before I move on. In my professional life, my colleagues continued to ask me to do things to serve in the Georgia Psychological Association. And I had been involved in a number of committees and led a couple of committees. They continued to ask me to do things like to be on the ethics committee, to chair the annual conference, and then when that went really well, they asked me to be the run for president back in 2012. I declined because I was relatively new to my gender transition at that point. Uh, I just did the medical aspect of my transition within about 2010. And by 2012, it's like, I'm not fully cooked. I'm still like needing to get in touch and figure out who I am. But what happened was they asked me again a few years later. And then I felt ready to do it by 2016. I felt ready to step up. But what I really think about when I think about being the president of the Georgia Psychological Association last year is that I had wondered about it years ago when I was a lesbian. Kind of cracks me up to say I was a lesbian nowadays <laughs> with this face. But at any rate, when I was a lesbian, I did not feel fully at ease with myself. I think that there was some inner battle and some inner energy, some struggles that I couldn't really be fully myself. So what I am aware of is that when I was able to become this person, I felt ready. I felt the energy. I felt the capacity. And I'm so grateful for the opportunity not only to serve my profession, but also that they trusted me and that I got to grow and meet so many people and develop new skills in myself as the president of the Georgia Psychological Association. And when I talk to parents and families and audiences, I tell them about this so they can understand, you know, if your kid is needing to transition, you may be freeing up all sorts of capacities in your child or in your loved ones by supporting them in being their authentic selves. Finally, in my family, remember, conservative, uh, I thought I'm going to totally lose everybody here. So that was the hardest part. I wrote them all letters because I thought if they're going to have a difficult time and need a minute, I'm going to let them have their reactions on their own and then come talk to me when they're ready. But fortunately, you know, being in my 40s as opposed to my 20s, I had a little more wisdom, love, and compassion to talk with them. And in the letter, it was very loving. And my siblings responded first, and they were very positive, as were their spouses and my nieces. And then my parents were in their late 70s at this point. And I'll never forget my mother calling and saying, your father said he had to go to his barbershop quartet rehearsal, but he said to say, hello, son. Now, when I think about that, that was even before I'd done any medical transition. And that 
stays with me because one of the greatest gifts in my life and of my transition is that my parents got to know me as this person. They both passed in 2017. I'm so grateful that we had a number of years where I could be this person and they could come to know me as their son. And dad would call me son and they would say he and they would call me by Ren. When I tell families about this, it's so important to embrace your children, to embrace your siblings, to embrace your parents, anybody, your grandchildren, aunts, uncles, nieces, nephews, because it, it just healed so much with my parents. We'd had this friction in our relationship for decades because I wasn't meeting their expectations of being a female. And ironically, that whole gender binary thing, those heteronormative expectations, actually worked for me in my gender transition because now I'm just a dude doing dude things and I make much more sense to them as their son. But it is one of the things I'm most grateful for in my life. It's so healing to have your family support. So if you're looking about how you can be supportive in your congregation or when people come out to you, I would say make sure to ask and use people's preferred names and pronouns if they're telling you they're going to be doing a gender transition. And then it's also useful to ask them who knows and in what settings you can use these names or these pronouns because they may not want everybody to know yet. You don't want to ask about surgeries. If you're not their health care provider or you're not dating them, it's not really your business. Surgeries, anatomy, don't define gender identities. So you just take people as they tell you they experience themselves to be. You can ask how you can help, and you can also make supportive comments, just like, thank you for telling me. I appreciate knowing. Thanks for trusting me. Some people get offended if you say something like, oh, I would never have known. Some people actually appreciate that that's a validating kind of comment. Other people kind of take offense at it. So that, I would stay away from that particular comment. So briefly, I'm going to describe a little bit about some other pronouns that are used. A lot of gender non-binary folks nowadays use they, them, their kinds of pronouns, which can kind of drive English teachers crazy. So, and I also like using an inclusive term, y'all, when I'm referring to folks in the uh, third person. We have some great terms that uh, you know, other folks up in the north may use, yuns or yous. Those don't quite roll off my tongue. But uh, you know, part of the point of these pronouns, not just driving English teachers crazy, but it's also, uh, you know, maybe the kids like demonstrating they're not quite the same as their parents' generation, but also there is a need to, uh, you know, be cool and groovy. There's really, I think, some psychological elbow room people want. And it creates social change. And when I think about that, you know, we had a change from universal use of male pronouns back in the day, and also racist language has evolved, so we can see a lot of changes. Now, since we're running tight on time, I'm gonna just close up real quick by saying you can be cisgender, which most of you are, and you can be all these things, gay, lesbian, straight, etc. You can also be transgender and be gay, straight, lesbian, and all these things. So they are very different. I hope I've helped that be clear to you. And then I want to finish by getting to some things from uh, about faith communities real quick and finish up for y'all. So in faith communities, what we're seeing is that about, this was a major survey done with over 27,000 adults online. And about 25% were identifying as spiritual but not religious, 23% as agnostic, 22% as uh, 
as atheist and 21% as Christian. So there's a lot of folks needing ministry and needing to be reached. And about 39% said they left a faith community because of fear of rejection. And then 19% actually experienced rejection in their faith communities. And of those, only about 42% found another faith community that that fed them and nurtured them. So if you here at St. Luke's are willing and able, there is so much need to do that. Now, I've provided some handouts to you in your seats, and you know, there are a few resources on there. The Human Rights Campaign, and there's also integrityusa.org, which is an, the Episcopal organization. And there is actually going to be a Eucharist at the General Convention in Austin in July. You can look at your forms, some of your activities, your language, your bathrooms, and maybe even starting a support group. There's a church, the Decatur First United Methodist started a support group that is so well attended that they now start meeting twice a month for uh, significant others, friends, family, and allies, as well as for the kids. Now, I'm willing to stick around and answer questions. Uh, I appreciate your having me here, and I thank you for tending to these issues.